Thank you, Gulbarg. And that was a good segue into our last speaker, Mohammed Tavakoli, um, who will deliver a talk entitled Habi Nafisi in the Iranian Cinema Digital Compendium. Thank you. Thank you. I think my title has slightly changed. I have decided to call it, for now, Haggling Nafisi. First, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, thank Rebecca Johnson and Danny Postel for their outstanding uh, work and also MENA Studies for uh, sponsoring the event today. And thank you to Ariel Rogers. Uh, in addition to thanking all of my colleagues here for their wonderful presentation, I have many things to thank Hamid for. But there is one thing that is really special. I'm really grateful to you for turning your back to your ancestral profession of medicine <laughs> and focusing on media. They have shared first four words, but that shift was essential. Otherwise, you would not have this great number of colleagues and followers here. What I have to say is already has been already said. You have heard it probably numerous times today and even last night. And it's of course very evident that in his long and prolific career, Hamid Nafisi has been a pioneering scholar of Iranian and transnational cinema. Beginning with his Persian articles in Tamasha and as I recently discovered in Rudaki, in the 1970s, and culminating in his four volumes of a social history of Iranian cinema, he has crafted an original, cohesive, well-documented, and self-reflective history of Iranian cinema from its earliest um, inception to the present. In his full, and dynamic narrative, he persuasively challenges the unidirectional view of cinema as an imported bundle of Western equipment, experts, rationality, and its accompanying visual culture, ideology, and subjectivity. Instead, considering Iranian cinema as concurrently local, national, transnational, and inter-ethnic, he has situated it within the pertinent and dynamic global contexts of capitalist expansion, technological and political revolution, centralizing states, urbanization, consumerism, and changing subjectivities and sensoriums. To account for the autonomous engagement of Iranians with cinema, either imported and dubbed, or national and popular, Nafisi critically engaged with my favorite Marxist theorist, Althusser, and Althusserian concepts of hailing and interpolation, and with the Gramscian notion of hegemony while acknowledging the hegemonic role of both Hollywood and the state in shaping and governing spectators' conduct, aspirations, and horizon of expectation, surpassing all to serve, he introduced an analytical concept such as haggling and heckling as counter-hegemonic modes of counter-hailing, and counter-interpolation. Further challenging the totalizing impulse of the Althusserian notion of the ideological state apparatus, Nafisi opened the analytical and narrativizing domain by exploring the creative blending of imported silent films with the vernacular, oral, 
and virtual, visual culture of screen recitation, Pardekhani. His analytical intervention transformed spectators from passive subjects of cinematic hailing and interpolation into active producers of meaning and experience. For instance, harnessing the art of Pardekhani to enhance spectators' engagement with silent films, he explained how each instant of screening became a contingent moment of dialogue and transnational blending and vernacularization. Similarly, spontaneous translators, the Ilmaj of intertitles and subtitles, served as interlocutors and creators of blended meanings and experiences that challenged and surpassed the texts and voices accompanying the early silent and sound films. As Nafisi elaborated, film reception involved many fascinating translational hailing and counter-hailing practices that facilitated or complicated film intelligibility and spectatorial subjectivity. Like live film translators Dilmaj described, explained, interpreted, and performed aspects of the movie for the spectators, most of whom initially could not read the intertitles of silent films or the subtitles of sound films. The widespread dubbing of foreign movies served a similar function with fascinating consequences for cultural and political accommodations to make the film intelligible and culturally acceptable, including censorship. Focusing on the movie theaters and public, as public spheres of national and transnational socialization and exchange, he further discerned that the intended Hollywood impact was frequently challenged by spectators, disruptive haggling and heckling. Quote, Iranian audiences interrupted, talk back to, translated, dubbed, fetishized, objectified, and haggled with the movies and movie stars transformed cinema's work from one of hailing to haggle. By thus engaging with the movies, the spectators were no longer just their consumers, but also the producers of their meanings. Making and watching the movies join together in a single unifying practice. The signifying practice of individual and collective, quote, cross-cultural haggling with the West and the Shah's government, unquote, in, Sa in Nafisi's account, had the radical political implications which became evident on the eve of the 1979 revolution. While actively and creatively engaging with the ongoing scholarly debates in the last several decades of the 20th century and beyond, Nafisi often haggled the academic convention, the academic convention of narrating, describing, and explaining in the third person voice that intended to promote objectivity and keep the subjective perspective of the author and the scholarly out of the scholarly research. So he haggled this convention of writing in third person disengaged. This Hamidian insubordination 
lack his subordination to the medicine of his <laughs> family. However, enabled Nafisi to authoritatively anthropologize and historicize his lifetime engagement with cinema. Moreover, Nafisi's self-recounting enabled him to provide detailed examples of how the very process of cinematic hailing and counter-hailing works. For instance, he explained how his teen, a, teenage cinematic self-othering became a major academic concern of his in the later part of his life. As he further elaborates, quote, I had been othered by my experience as a film spectator. But it is part of the polysemy of cinema that I was able to use the agent of my othering in my reconstructive project of selfing. Indeed, making films, teaching, and writing about films, and organizing film festivals were strategies for my self-understanding, self-narrativizing, and self-fashioning, both at home and in exile. In a retrospective self-analysis, Nafisi further discerned these strategies were, in the final analysis, forms of subla sublation, the Hegelian concept of Aufhebung, transcending, which resolved my non-Western and Western contradictions into a newly formed, hybridized unity. It involved identifying with the West, idealizing it, fetishizing it, consuming it, becoming subject to it and consumed by it, resisting and subverting it, and finally contributing to its remaking. It was a heterologic process by which I, me, myself, and he gradually, but not permanently or unproblematically, came to map onto one another, creating a partial and multiple subject who was simultaneously both here and there. Such potent telescopic self analysis and discernment endowed Nafisi with a polycentric, polyvalent, and polymorphic understanding of the process of cinematic globalization and deterritorialization, a comprehension that informed his coining and exploration of the accented cinema. Nafisi's brilliant study of exilic, diasporic, and post-colonial cinema has established him as a leading theorist of transnational cinema. Within this Nafis and Nafisian transnational context, it is worthy to note that the late 20th century emergence of accented cinema. However, as I think Goldberg implied, was already visible in the formative phase of Iranian cinema when immigrants from Russia, Ottoman Empire, and India were actively engaged in establishing its foundation, a beginning not very different from the early immigre composition of Hollywood and American film industry. However, 
these early accents of cinema were considerably different from the content contemporary Iranian accented cinema. The transnationalism of our contemporary time was thus likewise visible in its earlier form in the formative period of Iranian cinema, which included inspiring immigrants from neighboring lands. To conclude, I want to just note that Hamid is not only a historian of theorists of cinema, but a theorist of Iranian modernity. And any serious student of Iranian modernity, whether literature, art, culture, politics, unavoidably must read Hamid's four volumes and other books in order to understand how modernity can be conceptualized beyond the binary of tradition and modernity. And as Goldberg noted, it is this solid foundational scholarship that not only creates a, the base for new scholarship and a, a lot of the really great work that was presented here today and I see in Iranian cinema, they all start with Hamid. But unfortunately, Hamid John, as the scholarship develops, they bow down, but they continue to haggle you. Because to show their originality, they have to come and criticize you. So you have, by, by doing this really masterful work, you have condemned yourself to many decades of haggling and challenging that is to come. And one of the places that we really want to also celebrate really Hamid's outstanding scholarship and really great work is this digital compendium that is called um, Cinema Ironica. It's a digital compendium that University of Toronto is in collaboration with the Encyclopedia uh, Ironica Foundation has established. And it is supposed to include, be a really comprehensive compendium of Iranian cinema and as Goldberg, who is the associate editor of the uh, project, has noted all the entries that we could find, they all come with fine details in Hamid's, and we are hoping to get all of you to become engaged in this project, and that would be another way of celebrating Hamid's lifetime contribution to the study of Iranian cinema. Thank you, Hamid. Thank <laughs> you.